Welcome to the HR Champions podcast with me, Phil Scott of HR Recruit, where I bring you leaders from the HR community. In our podcast, we will be discussing their careers to date, their passion for HR, and the challenges they've faced along the way. Today, I'm delighted to introduce John Stuart King, Global HR Partner at Kingrid Group. Kingrid Group are an online gaming and marketing company, and they are recently featured in the Great Places to Work, ranked number 10 uh, in the best tech care businesses to work for. So I'm extremely interested to hear from John and to see what's happening at Kindred. So John, I'm going to pass it over to you. Uh, please give the uh, the listeners a quick overview of who you are. Thanks, Phil. Uh, and yes, I'm delighted to be here with you and your listeners today. Um, so as you say, I'm John Stuart King. Uh, I am uh, currently working for Kindred Group as the strategic global HR partner, uh, looking after a, a number of their functions. Um, I've been there for around about a year and a half now, uh, having joined from uh, a rather different global materials business. Um, I've been in HR since about the early 2000s um, across a range of businesses uh, in a range of positions, um, mostly in generalist positions, but I've also had the opportunity to work in areas including uh, talent and development, um, supporting uh, reward, uh, another of the uh, HR function areas. Um, uh, working for Kindred is a very interesting experience. Uh, I joined into the organizational effectiveness team, um, which had it's one of the things that drew me into that particular role in that particular business, uh, was working particularly in areas including operation, operational uh, model design, uh, implementing uh, organizational effectiveness, helping the business to improve and deliver against their operating models. Um, and it was a, a role that had a huge amount of change and pace behind it. So it looked like a really interesting role coming into from some of my previous experiences. Um, um, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. Brilliant. Um, so let's start at the beginning um, of your career. How did you first get into HR? Yeah, it, it's always an interesting question that because I find there are so many routes that people tend to take into HR. Uh, I think unlike a lot of people, I, I actually I made a choice to join HR uh, following my law degree. Um, I decided that uh, legal practice wasn't uh, the route for me um, and I wanted to move into HR. So I went on to do a, an HR master's degree straight after that. Um, uh, and did some volunteer work in a local call centre to gain some experience, which I, I realised I had very little of at the time. Um, I will admit uh, a call centre HR was a very uh, eye-opening experience and an interesting introduction to the HR world. Um, I moved on from there and after uh, uh, my degree, um, joined a small engineering consultancy uh, called Parkman uh, in Liverpool. Um, that was at the time 600 people, um, but uh, I joined two weeks before they went into a merger, um, which saw them kind of more than triple in size. Um, I was with them for a little over six and a half years, which saw them grow from, again, that business of 600 that I joined to a business of over 12,000 people by the time I, I left. Um, so a huge amount of change, a absolutely fascinating place to start your HR career um, and an opportunity with that level of change pace um, and activity going on just an opportunity to, to get involved in just so many different parts of HR and and I will admit that's one of the things that I've enjoyed most about being in HR is the level of variety the opportunity the chance to get involved in different aspects of HR um, while always having that kind of generalist background, being able to take those different opportunities uh, as they come up um, to do those, those different specialist areas, which I think has always been something that for me has really added to my generalist background, which is what I've always described myself at heart. Um, but developing those more specialist skills kind of adds different strings to uh, my bow as I go. And I think it has, uh, helped me to be a, a better generalist uh, in different ways. So, um, um, it's the variety then, is it, that uh, attracts you to HR? Uh, variety is one of the things that I, I really enjoy about HR. Um, the variety of the roles uh, and the activity and the things that we can do um, in HR. I think the thing that keeps me in HR, though, 
um, is just how transferable HR is across businesses and across industries. Um, uh, I'm a naturally curious person. I enjoy learning about businesses, the way they operate, the way they run. Uh, I find them fascinating. Um, and for me, one of the, the real benefits of HR is just how transferable it is. Uh, during my career, I've worked in an FMCG. Uh, well, again, I mentioned I worked in an engineering consultancy. Um, uh, spent some time in a um, insurance, a financial insurance company. Um, again, a global materials, uh, material science business, uh, and now an online gambling business. Um, so the, the ability to transfer industries and companies, I think, is what keeps me in HR and keeps things so fresh for me. Okay. And um, I mean, your career's progressed, um, you know, pretty steadily. What would you say the, the secret is for that progression? Um, you know, what's enabled you to progress? So I think in, in the start of my career, um, I, I came at it in a, 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 what was at the time a fairly normal way. I was looking at pretty linear progression, moving up through the HR ranks, um, which I think was was pretty standard at the time. Although I think um, slightly through later in my career, I think what I found I enjoyed more uh, was looking at, at the breadth rather than just moving up um, and looking at the uh, parallel moves both across industries, across businesses, uh, and within organizations as well. And I think those sideways moves taking on slightly different roles within talent and development, um, picking up additional responsibilities or doing things differently within existing roles. It's, it's that breadth that I have enjoyed um, as well. And again, that, that again is also for me, again, one of the benefits of an HR career. Um, but building that breadth, um, as well as being able to take depth in certain areas, um, I think is what's enabled me to get to the position that I'm in now. Um, moving industries I have found to be something that's really developed my, my knowledge and, a bit, and ability to bring HR experience to bear in certain problems and scenarios and situations um, where a depth and breadth of knowledge really helps to come up with different ways of thinking. Uh, perhaps a really good example being coming into uh, Kindred um, being a, uh, an online gambling business uh, may feel a long way from uh, material science, but particularly in the areas of compliance, player safety, um, kind of slightly the ethical side of that industry. Uh, coming from an industry which has a huge amount of uh, priority placed on health and safety, I think really helped me to come to the, the player safety uh, angle with a lot of experience and a lot of depth that perhaps I may not have uh, brought if I'd come perhaps in a slightly more linear way up through the organization. So again, I, I'm able to come with, with different perspectives, often best practices and knowledge and understanding from industries that, that might be in a different place uh, from other organizations and where those, those kind of parallel understanding of ways of working, behaviors, skill sets, um, enables me to bring something different to an HR role um, in those situations. And um, you, you sort of talk about uh, breadth of experience. And when I chat with, um, you know, a, a lot of people on these sort of podcasts, one of the things that they say is that, um, you know, that, that they try not to sit in a silo uh, and just HR in a silo. I mean, have you, have you found that? Is that what, is that what um, you do in your particular role? Do you get out into wider initiatives? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's it can, again, it's slightly back into your question of perhaps how I got to where I am. Um, a big part of that is, is um, being curious, looking for opportunities and then being prepared to take opportunities, even where perhaps you might feel uh, even slightly a little out of your own depth at times. Um, those often are the moments where I find I've, I've learned the most, I've experienced the most, um, perhaps be, being uh, okay to make a few mistakes along the way but knowing that you know, you'll learn a lot from those mistakes um so yeah being able to look at the different opportunities um i think uh, my experience at michelle was definitely one of those again those six and a half early years 
Um, I did a systems implementation, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, and again, something I'd recommend to every HR practitioner is to get some good experience in, in HR systems, you know, how they work, putting them in place. Uh, that gave me great insight to uh, then being a user of those systems, um, knowing how the different parts of, of HR work. Um, I did a spell uh, as a head of talent and development, um, which again, for me, is a an area where HR adds just an incredible amount of value to the organization is through that area of developing capability uh, and people and talent strategies in the business. Um, and while I'm, I'm very happy in that generalist position that I hold, having that skill set and, and understanding um, both allows me to work in a very different way with my colleagues in talent and development, but also enables me to bring something to bear in my generalist working with you know, the executive members that I work with. Um, that is something that, again, adds a huge amount of value to the organisation. Um, and uh, have there been any particular uh, standout achievements of uh, stood in good stead? Um, one of the areas I enjoyed the most, and I think I developed the most, most in a couple of different ways, uh, was um, putting in place uh, from scratch a uh, senior leadership and development program for um, the material science business that I worked for. Um, it didn't exist at the time, so we kind of uh, uh, we um, I had uh, seen the opportunity and the need for this type of development activity to to address uh, some succession challenges that the business had at the time. Um, I partnered with uh, Cranfield University to develop a program from scratch that would look to be a, a global program for leaders in the business. Um, that was a, a great opportunity to, as I was new in the business at the time, one, to learn a lot about the capabilities that would make great leaders in that organization, both behaviors and some of the skills that were required for them to be um, the leaders of that organization that's both kind of people leaders commercial leaders um i i will admit the experience was fantastic for me uh, developing that program putting it in place uh, delivering it running it for the business then having multiple cohorts people after it had in effect proven itself and its value to the organization uh, the other thing i will admit that i i feel i got out of that program was kind of being in the back of the room being a sort of a semi-participant in the program myself um was something I learned a huge amount from around kind of, um, it, it kind of interesting to think, but again, that kind of the, the global economics uh, side of things, the kind of the, the more uh, macro political landscape, um, the, the broader aspect of business development. Um, and it's something I could take back into my HR career that I think just in many ways makes you more commercial and credible as an HR practitioner. Um, having this understanding of the way business operates in the world. So, so for me, I think both the delivery, design, delivery, execution of, of a program that added huge amount of value to the organization, but also from a personal perspective, a learning experience, um, that was something that uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, and got a huge amount out of. So uh, just bringing it on to um onto kindred um current organization uh, they were recognized recently uh within the great places to work what do you think wh wh why is kindred excelled what, uh, what what do you think um makes them a great place to work i suppose um yeah good good question um i think i think great places to work is a great indicator that a business is doing well at, at many things. Um, you know, Kindred has been uh, a part of Great Places to Work for a number of years. Uh, it's not the only business that I've worked in uh, that puts a lot of value in uh, both Great Places to Work survey itself as well, but also the whole program around um, engagement in the organization. Um, so if, I mean, for Kindred, you know, they value what it says about the business as being a, a great place to work. You know. Their number 10 um, and alongside some other fantastic businesses. So to, for them to be recognized alongside them as a great place to work is a huge achievement um, for them. Um, in terms of how they achieve that, there's no silver bullet for engagement. And I, I also believe there's no shortcut for engagement in a business as well. Um, businesses that, that you know, want to take these things seriously, deliver and recognize that engagement adds value to the business 
um, you know, requires quite the commitment. Um, and it needs to be a commitment that's you know, long term, that's sustainable, um, particularly if you're genuinely trying to build engagement um, in your organization because you recognize the value it gets both externally as recognition for what you do, but also internally for what it does for the organization, you know, the way it engages people, you know, their productivity, um, the value they can then add to the organization. Um, so when you I guess when you come back to, to Kindred um, and what it's meant to them, um, I think one of the things that, that Kindred have always done very well at is, is really connecting uh, people to the, the purpose of that business. You know, what do they do? The, you know, the business is an online gaming business um, and they're incredibly passionate about what they do. And they're also very passionate about how they do it as well. And particularly uh, that the role they play in the industry to be a, a, a leading example of a, an ethical and sustainable operator in an industry that, you know, you know um, it's a difficult industry to be in. It's difficult as it's, you know, it's a very hard, high paced business, it, you know, lots of regulation, um, uh, very competitive. So challenging business to be in uh, and one where, you know, I'm sure a lot of your lis listeners uh, may have some personal experience of, of people that have had um, problem gambling experiences, either through people they know in the past. So, so some challenge, but you know, Kindred was both passionate as, a, as an operator uh, wanting to make gaming that enjoyable experience for customers, but also an experience that is, is safe for people to come to. Um, and recognizes that they have a responsibility to to um, to their customers and to the you know, the population that engage with them as a, as an operator. Um, but yeah, their their passion as an operator has always been there. Um, it's it's where they started um, having that passion for creating um, a better gaming experience for their customers, um, and that kind of commitment, that culture is still there and has grown over the years. Um, and so having that clear sense of purpose, you know, why we're here, what we're here to deliver um, is something that really resonates deeply and personally with people. And it's something that our staff really connect to. Um, and obviously that's not something that uh, organizations can change or build overnight. Um, but I think for me, it's if I think about what has really made Kindred successful, it, it is that purpose um, that people really deeply and personally connect to why they work for Kindred. Um, and I will admit I've had other organizations that have done this very well as well. Um, I worked for SC Johnson for a period of time, and that was another industry, another business um, that had a very clear long and well-established connection to both its people and also to the environment. Um, as a result, you know, they really walked the talk in that space um, and their teams, their people understood that they saw the commitment from the organization and that made a connection to them as well. Um, and it's that clarity of purpose, I think, that, that really sets a lot of organizations apart that do engagement really well. And Kindred does the hygiene factors, I think, well. Um, uh, they do a number of things, particularly around um, from a local perspective. They have local uh, engagement champions who champion local initiatives uh, to help engage and uh, do things that are relevant and meaningful for the local populations. Um, there's global activities that also really help um, to uh, engage people. A good example would be the kind of the level of value they place against action against the uh, great places to work feedback so genuinely taking the feedback um, making decisions wanting to improve feeding that back so and that, that for me is I think is a lot of the hygiene around how you do and how you engage with an activity like great places to work surveys um, but in terms of how that really makes the difference to an organization that really is the the why and the purpose and something that people genuinely and personally connect to. And I know um, when we've spoken previously, we've talked about um, fast paced environments and, and how Kindred's, uh, you know, in that 
uh, sector where regulation and the industry changes um, pretty rapidly. And uh, you mentioned how it's important to continually realign your workforce and the skills. Um, how, how, do, how do you manage to achieve that? Uh, yeah, uh, being an online gaming organization, again, we, we've got brands in the UK like 32 Red, um, uh, Unibet, so, so quite well known brands in the organization. As I said, the, 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 the industry is highly competitive, um, subject to really rapid regulatory change and also technology technological change is incredibly rapid in that business uh, and in lots of different places um, as well the business has grown rapidly over the last 20 years uh, and particularly in the recent uh, few years it's it's grown to be a business of um, uh, kind of nearly a, a, a billion pound uh, annual revenue um, uh, from around about uh, 17,000 employees. Um, uh, it's uh, again, a global business in many parts of the world, uh, including growing in the United States at the moment. Um, so yes, a very fast paced organization, um, which means the business has to be able to be agile and adapt to those, those changes. Um, a, a big way it does that is to be alert to the changes in the the world, the, the regulatory changes that can come on very quickly. And I think also it's about being really focused on the customers and the way that, um, you know, why our customers choose us um, and how we engage and work alongside our customers. Um, it may be slightly oversimplifying to say, you know, the way that one of the ways that it achieves um, aligning its workforce against what it needs to do is you know, making sure it's got the right roles and then the right people in the right roles. Um, but that's kind of it at, at heart. But then how it achieves that is, that's the, the, the challenging part. Uh, how do we continue to define what roles we need, how they operate, um, the right behaviours that we have in the organisation, uh, making sure we've got the right skill set to be able to deliver against the challenges that can change very rapidly. Um, Inevitably, you need to have a number of tools in your toolbox to be able to do that. Um, like any business, particularly in very challenging times, you know, unfortunately, it, it does have to make redundancies at times. It is, you know, it's always a, a last resort option, um, but it is something that, again, I think any any industry um, in that kind of highly changeable uh, industry needs to face into. Um, but the way it does it, particularly to make sure that those are you know, last resort actions, is by taking that long term view of, of skills and capabilities um, and having a real commitment to internal learning, development, progression and appointment. Um, so the business tries quite actively to have a strong balance of internal promotion and development, as well as external appointments and people coming into the organisation. Um, that means we can try to keep a, a good balance of um, fresh perspective, um, external mindset and, and insight, as well as strong internal knowledge about the business, about um, the industry. Um, and by growing the skills that we need, um, we can do that. Um, Is that way... how you, um, you focus on the skills that... Um you need for tomorrow obviously we talked about realigning what skills you need today i mean um how do you try to forward plan and and, and make sure you've got the skills that might be needed next year next you know next few years yes yeah, so obviously any any plan that looks further than a year uh, will probably be, be different by the time you reach it so ones that has to be constantly readjusted um the best way i think to describe it is that the business tries really hard to foster an internal learning culture uh, where we really encourage people uh, to develop themselves, to develop their skills, to be externally referenced um, in their industry, to be you know, well connected, uh, to be developing their behaviours as well as their technical skill set. Um, we work very hard around areas of management and leadership capability. Um, it's also a business that really likes to promote from within. Um, and develop its own um, and build the capabilities that it needs rather than being reliant on other industries and other companies to develop 
skills and then buy them in, which may not be exactly accurate for what we're looking for. So that, that learning culture is really important. Uh, we've invested heavily both in technology, uh, people, courses, um, content, um, and uh, that's a, a really good way that we continue to make sure that the capabilities and skills are, are aligned to, to what the business needs. And how has um, COVID-19 affected the business operationally? Um, yeah, I, th I think the business was fairly well placed being in uh, a digital business. Um, it was it was in a, a reasonably strong position when the world moved you know, pretty fast and hard away from that physical co-working to being more virtual co-working. Um, so uh, I think we're, you know, we were in the starting blocks already in a, in a good position. Um, a lot of the technology was there. And it, it's not just obviously the technology, it's the culture that allows people to both work, but also then collaborate uh, from, a, from a virtual perspective. Um, so the culture was good. Um, yeah, I, I think what the, the COVID situation saying that has done is, is merely accelerate the direction that you know, this industry and many others was was already going, which was to make it more virtual, more global. I think it really just accelerated and forced a lot of organizations to, to kind of push ahead with these activities anyway. So I think in many ways, fortunately, you know, not not too much of a surprise. Um, yeah, you know, I'm very fortunate that that this business being a again an online business um, was in that slightly more ready prepared and therefore was able to adjust very quickly particularly compared to perhaps an organization that's a, you know requires much more presence um you know, like a manufacturing or a logistics business where you don't have quite the same level of opportunity to uh, to move to home working quite in as a, a seamless way that other organizations are going to be able to do um i, I think Though COVID, you know, it's put a lot of businesses in a very difficult position. Um, and clearly a lot of businesses at the moment are fighting for their survival. Um, but the one thing I think this does, particularly from an HR perspective, I think HR has never been put more at the heart of um, the current situation and the current level of change. Um, the change, though, this is a, it's, a, it's interesting because it's a condition, unlike the financial crisis, which was a much more intangible uh, crisis. This is a crisis that is about as physical as you can possibly get. It affects people. Um, and that is where, pe where HR uh, absolutely step into their own when it's all about the people. Um, so while there's no doubt, particularly I do think for, from an HR perspective, it's probably one of the most challenging times at the moment to be an HR professional. But at the same time, I think I do think HR has never been in a better position to be able to influence the future direction for organizational practice um, and help businesses to survive and get through uh, the current conditions and times that we're we're living through. Um, I also think we're very well placed to be able to help the business then think about you know, what, what does the future look like for the way that we work. Um, there's no doubt that this situation is is changing the way people think and feel. And I'm sure, you know, although I've no crystal ball, I'm sure that there'll be no returning back to exactly how we were before. I think people's expectations have changed. And I think HR are, are at a very, again, unique position to be able to, to help businesses really think about the cultures, the skills, the practices, the capabilities that they need in order for them to be really successful. Um, coming out of these, you know, the immediate COVID situation that affects the people and uh, the economy as a whole. Um, yeah, and HR can, can shape that in perhaps in a way that we've never been able to shape uh, industries and work uh, before. Yeah, it's definitely uh, going to be interesting. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, HR got a big part to play in, uh, in that reshaping of, uh, of the workforce and where they work from, et cetera. So I just want to um, talk about the sector for, for a second. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. um, you in the uh, in the gaming gambling sector, um, not everyone's cup of tea, um, yeah. but um, what's the stance of the organization towards their ethical responsibility? Yes, yeah, so um, as, you, as you say, uh, it's not everyone's uh, ideal industry. Um, I, I will admit uh, that, uh, 
you know, when I first saw the role, um, I was I was intrigued as much as anything else. Um, uh, and I even had my own kind of reservations when I first thought about this uh, and very much had to do my own due diligence um, on the organization. Um, I wasn't a, a gambler myself, so I can't say I was particularly uh, well versed with the industry or, or the company in itself. Um, but obviously, it's very topical at the moment. Um, so, so yes, did have to do my own due diligence on the organization and, and look and kind of come to my own personal conclusions with that. Um, uh, yeah, coming in with my eyes open. Um, there's no doubt it's a it's a it's a bit of a challenging one. Um, as I said before, it's an it's an industry where, you know, in some ways, similar to the drinks industry, people can experience you know, genuine real harm. Um, where, uh, as as problem gambling is is a part of the industry. Um, the one thing that I I very quickly learned about Kindred coming into that was the position that they take on wanting to be an industry leader and work alongside you know, other operators in this space um, and be that kind of at the forefront of sustainable gambling uh, and making sure that you know, this should be an experience for everyone that is entertaining and safe. Um, and actually, it's one of the reasons why I was most interested to come into this business. Um, was uh, so my role particularly also works alongside player sustainability compliance um, and a lot of the functions that really you know, support that that ethical position of um, the business in the industry um, and I felt coming into this role that was something I could also really support and help um, with the experience again I mentioned particularly coming from industry um, where health and safety is such a, you know, it's, it's the number one priority. I think I had some really unique perspective and insight on t into uh, this, although it's again, it, although it's, it's a, uh, a parallel activity, it's still one where you know, the physical and mental safety of people is at the heart of what you do. Um, as a result, that's something I really thought uh, I wanted to be a part of and thought that I could help to you know, support those areas of the business, maybe to look at things differently, to do things differently, you know, build the capability, think about things in a way that perhaps they haven't thought of before um, through bringing in insights from, from different industries. Um, uh, so, so yes, um, it was an interesting one coming into. Um, it's the one, I see, and I mentioned before, I mentioned about the, the passion in the industry for, or in, in the company for, uh, for gambling. Um, and that's there, but I think as, as much as the passion for, for what they do is that passion to do it safely. Um, I've, I've been amazed at some of the individuals that I've met in the organization um, and how committed they are to, to making sure that this is an industry that is safe and that this is you know, particularly kindred and our products are one that are, are safe for people to use. Um, and the way that we identify, you know, even potential problem gambling behavior and help people to, to stop. Um, that's been quite inspiring for me um, in the way that they are absolutely passionate and committed to doing that. Um, and remains again, remains one of the reasons why I'm, I'm at the business is because there is so much potential to continue to help the organization and other organizations to really understand how we can continue to make it a, a, a safe industry for people to come to. Um, okay, right. I'm going to move the discussion on to uh, some quick fire questions about yourself. Um, we've got just a few minutes in the, left in the podcast. So give me three uh, people who have been most influential to you. Um, yeah, I, I had to think about this one a lot because I, I, if I'm honest, part of me struggled to, to nail it down to three. Um, uh, I'd like to think that I'm influenced by a lot of people, um, both people that I've worked for, worked with. Um, you know, I quite enjoy it. I've got a bookcase full of um, management books um, that I probably don't read enough of, but uh, there have been genuinely a few that have been really uh, insightful and inspirational uh, to me. Uh, I'm a particular fan of uh, Simon Sinek uh, and um, some of his work. Um, I've had the, the again the honour of working for some you know some genuinely impressive HR people uh, throughout my career, um, uh, and they've yeah, they've often lay, uh, left their mark on me in terms of. Uh, 
you know them being both mentors and coaches for me in the way that they work in businesses um as much as anything saying that the you know, working alongside business leaders uh, from within industry and from from a perspective of being a, a leader in an organization has has inspired me um a lot because again I, I do look at hr as being a business function um and one that contributes in the same way that finance does and then the other part of a, a business organization and so working alongside general business leaders um, has been very shaping for me in the way I think about HR and the way I deliver an HR service to an organization. Okay, um, so I'm going to ask you about self-development. Um, once you hit a certain level, um, it becomes your responsibility. Um, what personal development do you do? Um, I, I, I think that the personal developer I probably do the most of um, is just being very um, interested in, in more than HR. Um, I, I particularly enjoy kind of reading very widely, um, lots of businesses, business articles, um, websites. Um, I, I think that's as, as relevant to an HR professional as you know, reading the latest uh, issue from the CIPD. Um, so I think, again, continuing to have a very broad approach um, is the way that I you know, continue to develop myself. Um, also, again, I think for me, a big part of it is about moving you know, from the move that I've made across companies and across industries and meeting new people, um, learning about what they do, um, you know, seeing the different things that they bring to different roles. I, I think that the experiences for me are probably as much shaping um, for my personal development as, as, as anything else. But it's just, for me, it's always been about being open to new opportunities, keeping a very curious mindset and being open to doing things differently. Have you had any setbacks? Um, if so, how did you overcome them? Um, yeah, I thought about this. I, I, I think for me, actually, um, I'd characterize it in my life as perhaps more along the lines of, of kind of life adjustments. Um, perhaps is a, a better way of, of thinking about it. You know, I started my career um, in, a, in a, I suppose, in again, a, in a pretty normal way, being characterized as having you know, very few responsibilities, um, ambitious, pretty career orientated. Um, and, and then as, as kind of life continues and life moves on, um, find that those prioritizations do, do change. You know, the introduction of a family, you know, changes your mindset your priorities and the way you look at careers very differently um i also had a had a rather uh, challenging life adjustment when i was 30 in developing type 1 diabetes which became something i then had to integrate into my life uh, and my career at the same time which was completely unexpected um and something that just had to be integrated in a way that allowed me to continue on with you know my life and my career but was definitely a, you know it's probably one of the biggest challenges I had in my life and again absolutely had an impact on how I operated from a work perspective including a work-life balance um, so so life adjustments I think for me was perhaps particularly for when I was younger rather unanticipated and unexpected you know you look back and with the benefit of hindsight you can see that they were inevitable but I guess when you're you know, young and again with fewer responsibilities you perhaps don't say, see these things coming in the same way but the one thing I think it does do is you know, continue to, to challenge your priorities, your priorities uh, you know, the values you place on different things in life uh, and it, it can put work into um, a different perspective than perhaps you had when you were, you were younger. Um, so I think that's just, I think, some of the challenges that I've felt along the way that have had different impact on me and, and required uh, yeah, different levels of adjustment in order to be able to continue to deliver what I was still ambitious and still am ambitious to achieve from a work perspective, but just requires integration of other things that are just as, if not more, important overall. Okay, it, um, thanks for that. Uh, we, we, we've got through quite a lot there, uh, to be fair. That's about all, all we've got time for. Um, one last thing, if anyone does want to get in touch, what's, what would the be, best way of doing that? 
Yeah, again, I'm always happy to, to hear from people. Uh, probably the easiest way to get in touch is through my LinkedIn, uh, John Stuart King. Um, you'll find me on there. So I'd love to continue to develop my, my network and connections. So yes, by all means, please reach out. And thanks, John. It's been uh, great talking to you. Uh, thank you for, for helping us uh, with this episode of the HR Champions podcast. I hope the listeners have enjoyed uh, viewing and listening to this and stay tuned for more episodes. Thanks, John. Thank you, Phil. Mm-hmm.